think probably the, the two or three biggest trends in healthcare right now that you see really globally are the shifting demographics to an aging population where you have um, older people with more chronic diseases getting sicker and needing more access to care and the big push that everybody sees now towards the, di towards the digitalization of healthcare. For the, the demographic side, um, everybody wants universal healthcare, but universal healthcare is extremely expensive. And particularly as people get to need healthcare more and more and the healthcare delivery systems and techniques get more advanced, then exactly the, the costs will balloon and governments will struggle to pay, to keep up with the financials of that and to pay for everything. Um, in the Philippines, the population is still relatively young, so it's, the demographic bubble is less of an issue here. But as more and more people access more sophisticated healthcare and the Philippines tries to implement universal coverage, it's going to become increasingly burdensome for the people. The, regarding the digitalization of healthcare, it's a lot more than just electronic medical records. It's really about um, integrating systems and providing more convenient access to the patients particularly in the time of COVID where people are afraid to come into the hospital, or afraid to see the doctor. They still need to follow up with their doctor. They still have healthcare problems and they need a way to access the system that is not necessarily coming into the hospital or into the healthcare provider. So that's the big push right now in digitalization is the kind of telemedicine consultations. And if you can go from a consultation uh, to diagnosis, to prescribing medication, ordering lab tests, ordering x-rays, then you can really start to get towards true telemedicine, not just teleconsultation. And I think that's where everything is moving right now really, really quite quickly. Now you hear a lot about digitalization and telemedicine and teleconsultations. In places where there's a mature primary care network, the digitalization of telemedicine or the, the evolution of telemedicine may put the primary care networks under pressure as patients preferentially access telemedicine uh, consultations rather than going into the primary care clinics. In places where the primary care network is less mature, less well developed, and patients tend to uh, enter the healthcare system in hospitals, um, they don't want to go to the hospitals anymore. So I think there's, um, there's ample opportunity for primary care networks in those environments to decongest the hospitals, get more convenient to the patients, and get them away from the hospitals where they don't want to go. Yeah. But that probably needs to be integrated with telemedicine. When building a healthcare ecosystem, I think the, the first thing you really have to think about is access to care. And when you think about access to care, uh, I try to think about what the patient wants and what are really patient habits. So if you think of primary care, patients generally don't want to travel very far for primary care. For things that are routine, routine to travel three or four hours to go see the doctor. <clears throat> what they're really looking for is convenience of care. When people have something that's very, um, very advanced or very difficult to manage, or you require very specific expertise, they're willing, and if they're able to, um, they're willing to travel much further. So this is where you start getting into advanced tertiary care and quaternary care, and you need true centers of excellence with significant patient volumes and significant clinical expertise. And people are willing to travel hours, they're willing to get on an airplane and fly across the country or maybe fly to another uh, city in the region or halfway around the world. So I think you wanna have the major referral centers, the major tertiary quaternary centers um, in for, in the Philippines, say, for example, in Manila, um, and they will act as the um, referral center for um, the satellite hospitals, which are the secondary and small tertiary hospitals, and the secondary and tertiary hospitals act as the referral centers for the primary care networks. If this can all be integrated through digital health, so telemedicine, teleconsultations, electronic medical records, uh, a PAC system so you can share x-rays and films, an integrated laboratory system so you can share laboratory results. That's ideal, um, but I think that the ecosystem has to think, I think primary, secondary, tertiary care, how far patients are willing to travel, need to travel, and then how to integrate it. I, I think that COVID has kind of spurred the recognition uh, to strengthen the public-private partnership and to strengthen the development and, and encourage, accelerate the development of the private sector. 
I think government facilities recognize now that they absolutely can't do it by themselves. Um, the, the patient volume and the load of critical patients overwhelms healthcare systems, particularly if they're focused into one sector, uh, government or private. And the government should look at the private sector as being a critical partner in care where they can provide essential services that the government system can't. So if you're looking at the evolution of the healthcare landscape, um, governments will need to support the growth of the uh, healthcare insurance landscape, um, both public and private, pushing towards universal coverage, whether that's um, public coverage or private coverage or a mixture thereof, probably with um, different gradations of coverage, uh, basic coverage for the public um, insurance people and then different levels of private coverage, different levels of premium and reimbursements. Um, this will help the private healthcare system to evolve much more quickly and much more robustly. And if the virus continues to spread, which it probably will at least over the next year or two, then the pressures on the intensive care units will not subside. And then you think about the seasonality of influenza, which already puts intensive care systems under immense pressure. You have the COVID on top of the uh, influenza, and that will probably overwhelm intensive care units. So they're gonna to need to have some sort of um, fungibility or easily expandable uh, intensive care systems. They'll need to have more ventilators, more critical care physicians, more critical care nurses. And this will probably continue for the next couple of years. And if COVID does turn into a seasonal virus and it is uh, more active in the winter months uh, like the flu is, then we can expect more critically ill patients for an extended period of time into the future, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, maybe in perpetuity, if we don't have an effective vaccine that um, will really suppress the virus. So I think that in addition to the development of the public-private sector partnership, in addition to the development of um, insurance and kind of a universal payer system, uh, we need to develop our critical care infrastructure for the forecoming 12 months, 12 years, 20 years, 50 years. It's really hard to say.